Hey, so welcome to another week of Strategy Snacks here with Sean Marcano. Um, I am thankful for everybody who is still keeping up, um, checked in, checking out every episode, liking, commenting, subscribing, um, and following, following along with this journey. Uh, so this episode uh, today is an amazing one. It's, it's a very special one. I was granted an opportunity to talk to Paul Schiffbauer Jr. Uh, he is a part of, he's a principal consultant of Schiffbauer Consulting Group. Um, and I was really, really excited to speak to him. We connected via social media. Uh, very random at that too. Like we followed each other for quite some time, but um, randomly he was like, ah, I would love to be in a podcast. So I reached out to him, checked out, um, you know, hit contacted him and, and kind of things went on from there. So we had an amazing conversation. Uh, so I do hope that you guys enjoy this. Now, another thing, my microphone is here before it like was up. I'm trying to find the right direction or the right way to keep the microphone so that I can like talk into it and as well as it won't disrupt, uh, kind of like disrupt the camera. So if you see me or like throughout the episodes, if you're checking out on YouTube, if you see this, this uh, microphone adjusting uh, different places or side, uh, sides, I'm just trying to figure out what works best. So. Uh, so far, I don't I don't mind in here. I think I have a bit more accessibility, like if I'm accessing my my uh, keyboard over here. But um, it's not too bad here, so I think I might might leave it here for recording. Um, so yeah, thank you guys. Please make sure to comment, like, and subscribe. Uh, we talked a lot about uh, design, marketing, strategy, but here here's the rest of the interview and, and enjoy the show. Appreciate it. So I am here with Paul. If I'm saying it right, Chef Bauer. You got it 100% on the money, Sean. Perfect. Uh, this is Strategy Snacks, uh, where we bridge the gap between brand and the user experience. So I'm really, really glad that you're here with us. And um, pardon me for my breath, I was just grabbing a drink. <laughs> so yeah, go ahead, give give us, uh, tell us more about yourself. I'm gonna say it's not a problem at all. With that being said, uh, my name is Paul Schiffau, or Sean is kind of introduced. I am the principal consultant at Shipbauer Consulting Group. We are a consulting agency, if you will, where we specialize in tailoring the strategy to our small to medium-sized business clients. And um, what makes us really unique is that really t personal strategy to you and your goals. And we really look to leverage analytics with everything we do from start to finish. All right. Well, as far as like consulting goes, I know like you had experience with being a founder, uh, working in like uh, operations and things of that nature. Um, could you let me like tell other people kind of like how that happened, like kind of that transition? Like what's that oh, origin story like? How did you get to this, pla to this place? Absolutely. That's a really fun story. Uh, so it, it kind of goes back to college. I was um, middle of like my career at your college of Pennsylvania. Shout out to YCP. Um, <laughs> Just, you know, business administration major, very entrepreneurial. Um, I come from a small business background. My father, I tell people, well, he owned a bar, and I grew up in a bar, essentially. He had it 20-plus years of my life. Um, so I've always had a, kind of that, like, spunk and that spirit just to kind of go out there and kind of create something for myself and others, more importantly. Right. Um, so how that old founding experience came across was an old high school buddy, really talented professional photographer, from my local area who was branching out and had a lot of independent success as a landscape photographer. I just like, Hey John, you know, why don't we take your work? You know, it's great, but there's hundreds of Instagram photographers out there. And I hate to put him in a box. He knew, <laughs> you know, with like, he, he's very like skillful, but like a lot of other photographers have what he has, but what they don't necessarily have is a, a brand, right? That, like a user experience that tied to that brand. So, we essentially developed a retail brand around his work called Know Our Gallery. And with that, our core mission was taking that landscape photography at the time. And the core tagline that we had and vision was, you know, to exhibit your story. So, you know, you go to Ikea and you see uh, photos of Times Square with the taxis. Nothing wrong with that. I know you're from the Bronx, Sean. Right. <laughs> you know, you see the Eiffel Tower, you know, like this. <laughs> Vistas are great, you know, and they might have some memory to you, but what it has more meaning to you, it might be, you know, that local York City scenery or this mountainside in North Carolina. We had over 10,000 different photos while I was at the company um, all across the world. 
And with that, it's we got really micro in terms of, okay, you know, we have Baltimore City, but we have more than just your tourist destinations in Harbor. We had over a dozen different neighborhoods wow. and like locales of wow. that with unique galleries. So we were really able to tap into a market where, I mean, the sales data correlated with it too, where over, I believe it was over 50% of <laughs> photograph, photographs and art pieces that were purchased while I was with the company. The shipping address of those particular customers, they purchased something that was within the 10 mile radius of their shipping address, believe it or not. Wow. And that number jumped over to 60% when we took that number closer to 50 miles. So we were really on the whole exhibit your story mantra and tagline and vision statement that we, that we set out for the company while I was with them. Really unique experience. Um, we did a couple of trade shows in North Carolina, which is known as the furniture capital of the world, particularly in High Point, North Carolina. Really interesting. Central North Carolina, you had people from China, Europe, um, South America, New York City, all would venture down twice a year to these trade shows, buyers, exhibitors to essentially just sell network uh, various furniture and home goods and accessories. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So with that, I worked with John uh, about five years. And then okay. that last three, two and a half, three years was developing this retail brand where uh, we were able, we had an advert in British Vogue, which was really cool. Oh, that's dope. Get, like, that's really, really cool. Standpoint out there. Um, and with that too, we were able to secure some wholesale agreements with Home Depot, Overstock.com. And Wayfair, just to name a few, right? Yeah. So, so what? How was that? What kind of struggle did you did you face? Kind of like what kind of adversity did you face uh, while helping bring up that kind of company to where it's at now? And um, you know, I I know you touch base on like storytelling is very very mm -hmm. important. Um, what what kind of like adversities did you face while uh, while being there? It's really ironic. In hindsight, the biggest challenges we had are are items that I'm fulfilling within my consulting group today, where okay. I saw the business, the problems and challenges we had as essentially small business owners and founders. And once I got, I broke out from that company, got bought out, um, just with, and that we'll get into that, but um, mm -hmm. it's just, okay. It came towards a point where, all right, how do we get bigger? How can we like reach more people, the people who are actually want to connect with our artwork more than just all our small in-house team of two to three people. Mm -hmm. So, with that, we were talking marketing agencies, and they were giving us these whole big spiels. And it's just like, is this really catered to us? Not necessarily. <laughs> as, yep, as they do. <laughs> yeah, and I, I hear it all the time. And it's just, it makes me, me mad, honestly. It's just like you're selling these particular clients something that's not necessarily in their best interest, short-term and long-term, um, just from A to Z. And then secondarily, too, it's just like from – an analytic standpoint, like, oh, you know, you work with us and you get this many views to your website and we'll, we'll get you, you know, this much reach socially. How is that going to translate to sales? I know, you know, it's not – revenue is not the end-all, be-all, but it is at the same time. You know, if you want to continue to grow your business, especially where we are at from just a startup to an emerging business before, like, I jettison off. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, with that, it was really kind of fascinating where – um, I broke off with my primary partner, John, just from a directional standpoint where the company was going. I didn't necessarily agree with him where the brand was going and how we were going to price product lines and collections and continue to push that story narrative. And this kind of culturally too, which I feel like a big component of branding, which a lot of people don't really tap into is your culture internally, mm -hmm. not just externally with your audiences and your customers buy into it's just how do you kind of grow a business culturally? How does that reflect your brand and who you are? Right. And being being that there are like many small businesses out there and this is like the perfect time kind of where like a lot of everybody's starting up their own companies, startups, um, entrepreneurial kind of ventures, so on and so forth. Um, what do you feel like is something that they can take from that kind of experience where like you have to develop your kind of the culture within the company? Um you know, like what can a, someone that's starting with their own company can take from that kind of experience that you had while being like a co-founder and helping out, helping out with operations? Yeah, absolutely. And I was essentially the co-founder director of op operations where essentially I wore 10 hats. Wow. And, <laughs> and I, mean, I, I think, yeah, and I think many business owners could like kind of feel for that 
because or kind of empathize the kind of that story because you have to be the boss one day the assistant the writer the the content creator the you know you have to figure out where you're gonna get up op- how's the operation gonna you know work out in of itself so um yeah no go go ahead yeah yeah it's it's a lot of grunt work and i mean a, a lot of founders and business owners out there i know they can correlate to that it's just like i'm more than just the boss you know sometimes like it doesn't matter if Sometimes I, I remember my father always used to say growing up where that's I kind of develop a lot of my kind of business philosophy. It's just he owned a bar mm-hmm. and like that's an industry where either you're very hands on or you're, you're totally hands off. But <laughs> you had a mantra where like, you know, if I got to scrub toilets, I'll scrub toilets, but I expect you to scrub toilets still. And I've definitely carried that throughout my personal experience, my professional experience. And sometimes you got to do the dirty work. Right. So it's just having to be ready to do everything that you need to do necessarily. Um, but with that too, I mean, in terms of like the overall environment, I mean, starting a business and especially now, right now it's a very challenging time for you would think to start a business, but I feel, feel like it's a perfect time. There's a lot of adversity. If you can get through everything that's going on from the pandemic wise, socially, culturally, mm-hmm. you can be very successful long-term. Mm-hmm. And I, I would just kind of, I think the key takeaway is be authentic to who you are and who you want to be. Um, especially in times that are challenging is like, yes, you may necessarily have to pivot, but don't necessarily pivot too far where it strays away from the long-term vision and long-term goals and who your audience ultimately is at the end of the day. Right. And that's very, very big, like, important that you said, like stay authentic to like yourself and, and what your goal is and don't pivot too far. Right. Um, and I think that comes a lot from your background and like storytelling and that kind of passion and, and what you have that in. Um, could you like, Talk a little bit more about that. Like, how does storytelling play into you developing your brand and uh, you growing and, and pivoting and even making changes? Because sometimes what you start off with in like a business or a direction that you're thinking about, sometimes you have to change and change course. Um, yeah, like dive a little bit deeper into storytelling. Oh, absolutely. So, I mean, in terms of kind of going into transitioning what I'm doing now from a consulting standpoint is... I really focus on working with other small business owners just because essentially I had that entrepreneurial startup small business experience and I kind of been in it hands on and then alternatively mm-hmm. too, I've seen it too. I mean, growing up in an, a small business environment. So it's with that, I really rationalize and level with small business owners and allowed me to build a lot of trust right off the gate where they've had a lot of, a lot of clients that I have and a lot of prospects that I've talked to mm-hmm. over the past two years where I've done consulting full time with that, it's just like, normally if someone comes to them with a pitch, whatever it be another agency, a sales rep at this radio station, this marketing company, I'm able to, I feel like they're able to solidify more trust just because of who I am coming right out the gate. They know my background or like I make my background known. doesn't mean you necessarily have to like work with me, but it's like, mm-hmm. I feel like it's, the blinders go off where normally they wouldn't necessarily go off. So I would really, I mean, to anyone out there, whatever your niche may be and what you're doing, it's find out who you really are to the core and what's not going to change. And how can you tap into the audience you really want to connect to where, yeah, you might not get that guarantee interaction or sale, but like, how can you, you know, make that conversation easier where it's just like, okay, this is natural, you know, like, yeah, yeah. I'm going to at least talk to him for, you know, 15, 30 minutes mm-hmm. to see what he has to offer and how he could potentially help me or improve my life and or business. Yeah. I'm a big, I'm a big advocate of like, uh, kind of decoupling and reverse engineering, like what it is you want to be. So I do oftentimes help people like, uh, you know, career help or career, career advice or mentorship. Um, and they come to me, well, like, yeah, I want to, I want to do this or I want to create this business, but they, they don't understand that there's a sort of trajectory or steps in order to get there. And so I try to pivot and change that kind of mentality of like, okay, well, where is it that you want to be? And then decouple that, like break it down into to various different pillars, right? Like in order for me to be a doctor, right? I need to do X, Y, and Z. And then before I do X, Y, and Z, I need to do these steps and these steps, so on and so forth. Um, so I know that, that is, that is a very good point. Absolutely. Um, mm, go ahead. Now, just to kind of piggyback what you're saying, I, I do a lot of that in my like consultations. It's this if this company comes to me and says, Hey, you know, I feel like we need to improve our search engine optimization SEO. It's like, why do you necessarily need to do that? 
And I really, I put it back on them. I said, well, where are you at right now in business? Where do you want to go? Who do you want to be? Not just now, but later. And what are your goals and how can we tailor a strategy to get there? And even from a budget standpoint, let's say you don't have all the money in the world to be a regional national brand. How can we break down in phases realistically where we can, you know, just take baby steps to get there? Mm -hmm. How does how does one get to consulting? I mean, me being I'm a designer, I often I've consulted with other people, but I know there's a lot of probably other listeners that you know have heard of consulting or would like to get to consulting or would. How does one get to that position where you can provide that kind of value to someone else? It's really interesting. It's just I felt like I had enough experience and enough kind of grit just to do it. Mm -hmm. Coming out the buyout um, from No Art Gallery, my startup. <clears throat> like hey i can feel a lot of founders a lot of like small business owners yeah i'm starting from kind of ground zero i did some freelancing prior okay you know so i had a field of like how does marketing work how does like strategy work going into it but it's like how can i really build a business for myself and more importantly provide value to others i really felt like kind of going to that getting out that gate had enough to get there mm -hmm. but i mean over time it's been really interesting it's a lot of ups and downs it's been a roller coaster i mean by all means i'm not really in you know i'm not making buku bucks you know I'm making <laughs> millions of dollars a year doing what i do but I'm, I'm doing well for myself and i've been able to provide value for a lot of clients which i think mm -hmm. is the most rewarding thing at the end of the day and that's good I, I like that transparency that you're you're explaining like well looks in like you're not like speaking like a guru that you see like on Instagram ads popping up and well, I can, I can make this amount of money for you and so on and so oh, forth. I'm the anti-guru. <laughs> yeah. Like I see so much of that on like social media. It's like, well, I can do this. And you know, your social media needs to go here and do this, that, and the third. Right. And I, it's a bunch of promises and empty lies, but I think that kind of transparency is needed because it's important that people that I guess want to get into the space of like strategy and consulting with the people, um, see that like, well, it, it's, it's lucrative. You can make money. You can become successful. But that journey, that process, is not as shiny as as one may think. It's bumpy. There's a lot of bumps in the road. Oh, extremely <laughs> bumpy. I mean, this time last year, I, mean, I felt like it was like Mad Men. I don't know if you've ever seen the series. <laughs> oh what? no, I heard about it. I heard about it. I was told to watch it. You, I feel like anyone in our space, like you have some appreciation for it. Like it's a slower TV series, mm. really well written. Like it's I'm good? big into. Yeah, it's really good. I gotta check it. So, I like I don't it. watch a lot of TV. Like film but like when i do it like i go like deep into it <laughs> um but it's just great from this the whole kind of marketing advertising standpoint and it's they base a lot of like historical data like error knowledge around it um mm -hmm. but i remember at one point not give too many spoilers up it's like the protagonist don draper has an interview with a reporter like mid-series about like you know you know you kind of rebrand and started a new agency like who is Don Draper and who's the agency? He's like, oh, well, last year, like, we almost sunk ship. This time last year, I've been over two years doing what I do. Like, I almost sunk ship. Oh, and wow. I, I was doing some good things. I was doing some things in hindsight where, like, man, I, like, leave some money on the table. I wasn't, you know, as proactive. I should have been in building my business. It's like, how can I, you know, be better off for myself and better off for my clients and provide more value? And essentially got to work and essentially this – was able to build like more so so solid pillars and foundation. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I mean, it's, I just want to add one more point real quick. You s talk about these gurus pr promising all these results. <laughs> um, I mean, my lead advertiser, he's a wizard. He has right. over 40 certifications. His average um, return on ad spend across 10 industries over the past two and a half years is 800%. Wow. So every dollar you spend with him, you make eight. Wow. But we go into every, Anything that relates to paid ads, we always say we do not guarantee results. We are not a performance marketing agency where a lot of these cats out there, and some of them are good. I give them that. But some of them, it's just like you can't – it's very risky to promise those things because every client's different, even if you are very niche-based. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's a lot of unpredictables. I mean like if you're like let's say in the real estate market, then you might know that niche top to bottom. You might used to work in real estate. Every client's different. You got to treat them like that. You can, you got to, I'm a firm believer strategy is essentially you got a toolbox and you just got to apply that toolbox to every situation uniquely because things happen. Mm -hmm. Could, could you break down strategy for those that may not know? Cause I know like sometimes people sprinkle the word, like it's like parsley, like on food, right? Like, 
Uh -huh. We just sprinkle <laughs> sprinkle strategy yeah, for sexy. razzle dazzle. It's just like ooh, it gives yeah. you a little extra flavor. <laughs> a little flavor, right? Could, no, but there's people that actually really, really like focus on what strategy is and how it applies to business and so on. Could could you like dive deeper into like what that is and how that benefits small businesses? Absolutely, it's essentially having. Uh, I mean, to really break it down, it's consistency, and with that, having a roadmap prior mm -hmm. to implementation. So it's just like, if we're going to do X, Y, Z, why are we doing it? What's the end goal? And how does that end goal connect to what we're about to implement and activate? So, okay, we want to get here as potential business or brand. Mm -hmm. If we're going to have a website update, why are we having this website update? Does it actually correlate to what we're doing and what our needs are? If we need to run paid ads past that website update, is it going to make sense with that regard? It's more than just, okay, we're just going to run paid ads and hope everything goes well. Right. Just spending money and, and seeing what happens. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, I'm a firm believer too, and it's, I feel like it might be unpopular with some other marketers out there where I, I recommend nine times out of ten to every client I talk to, we need to do a website audit before we run any kind of paid traffic to your website if they want paid traffic. Because if your your website's not optimized, any paid traffic you run to your website is suboptimal at that point from an analytics standpoint. <laughs> right. Or even a, a UX standpoint. It's just like if you're a service-based business and you have no contact forms on your homepage or what like we, key areas of your website, it's just like, what, what are we doing then? What are we doing? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> what are we collecting? What is the... You need to get some sort of data to, to, yeah, yeah. And, and for, as a small business owner, um, what are you like speaking about is like, you can't just put on your site, you'd have these services and then like no way of getting in contact with you or no way of getting information about the people that even visited to your site. And, um, there needs to be some sort of like background check, some sort of understanding of like, what do you offer on your site? What is put on your site and, and with a purpose? Um, and if, if I if I missed out on any of that, feel free <laughs> to, no, to yeah, expound yeah, yeah. on I mean, it. You're, you're reading my mind. That's yeah. <laughs> literally I have a lot of those conversations. I remember even some tough conversations came during when kind of COVID hit, where mm. we were talking to a couple of prospects where they wanted to sign on, um, and a couple of them did. It's just like, hey, can we just get right to paid ads? I'm like, I'm like, I told one particular client in general, like, no, I mean, it's it is in your best interest based on where your website is right now. It was just a WordPress website. You don't have any analytics. You don't have any SEO. We need to beat this up locally for you. That way, when we run paid traffic, it's going to be great. And then you're going to get some organic push kickback on top of it. Mm. And hey, he's getting leads every week. So. That's, that's great. And, and oh, man, I, I so much to talk about SEO and optimizing. Um, I, I've redone my site. Well, I've redone several sites um, counts of times, like 10, 20, 30, 40 times, iterating and experimenting trying to figure okay what can work how can i attract attention uh that is that is a very slept on key of building your seo and your site and having the right content there to attract the right people like you said locally so that you can then push out and and and, and get the traffic elsewhere mm -hmm. did you did you see yourself uh getting into the space uh when you were younger Oh, that's fascinating. So look, <laughs> let's look back like <laughs> 10 years ago. I was still in high school. I was, it's ironic though, Sean. It goes full circle. <laughs> yeah, it, 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 it really does. I wanted to be in poli sci ever since I was a little kid. Okay. All the way through up, literally my senior year of high school. Wow. So, I mean, political strategy. But like all of a sudden I'm dealing with marketing and business strategy primarily. Okay. Where I just had a kind of epiphany like, do I really want to go and be in poli sci and play that kind of game? I'm like, nah, I don't know. Yeah, that's fine. I'm in the strategy space. Right. So, I mean, it's really cool and rewarding in that regard. So, indirectly, yes, but no. But I no. didn't think I would necessarily be like working with small business like I am. If you said 10 years ago, I'd be doing what I'm doing. I thought I'd be doing some other things, but I wouldn't have it any other way. I'm very happy where I'm at right now. Right. I, I think the, the I'm glad that I have you here and you're discussing strategy. The big thing for me, why I've made a transition from design to this like UX product design space mm -hmm. and uh, is because I kind of made a bounce into brand strategy and learned about creative strategy and um, understanding the like, well, what we create has to meet certain KPIs and, um, you know, there it, it can be very fluffed depending on 
you know, how could you say that this digital asset is creating this amount of push? I mean, there's some analytics in some senses, but to to use that or certain KPIs to say that, well, this is the reason why we got this amount of money this entire year, this quarter is it, for me, it's a little bit broad. Um, so I kind of dabbled in it and I, I learned from it. And then I kind of made my transition into like this UI UX space where it's still influenced by data. It's still influenced by analytics. Mm. Um, and so I just love that part of it of like learning about this data and then how, what can we do to make the business better? That was pretty cool. But I, I stayed away from it cause I love design so much. Um, and I was like, if I stayed in this space, I'm not going to design so much. And it, it was, it was a, I had to I had to decouple that in my brain. I had to like figure out, okay, this is this might yeah. not be it. <laughs> um, okay, no, thank you. Um, as as far as like you growing up and 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 uh, you're essentially from PA, right? Um, and you went to York, yeah, and you went to York. How was that experience in college? And I know some people are saying or well feel that like college might not be necessary to go to, and um, that that's like the right direction. Do you, do you regret it? Do you enjoy it? Would you push further? Could you? Could, how was college years? It's really funny. I, was, I recorded a podcast on Sunday, and I had a special co-host, and then the guests. They both dropped out of college. Oh wow! So they were wow. in college. But like they both had rewarding experiences from college. You mm-hmm. know, I'm talking about me at the time. I'm very happy. I went through a full program in college. I don't mm-hmm. think I was necessarily had the hunger to do it all independently mm-hmm. without being in college. And I was very fortunate where I went to a private institution where the business program, they had a number of professors that had a, a lot of tangible real-world experience. And we had smaller classes. So I was involved with, I know one particular class um, was an operations class. Uh, the adjunct professor was literally was the director of operations for like a growing, <laughs> emerging healthcare like conglomerate in my local area. That's mm-hmm. what he did prior. And then he did operations consulting at that point when I had took wow. a class with him. So really real world experience. And we had like marketing professors who had like tangible consulting, like market research, old school experience. It was more than just, hey, I wrote this many books or I read this many books. Yeah, yeah. I had that too. But, you know, it's it was nice to see the duality to the experiences from the more theoretical professors and the more practical, tangible professors. Practical. I think for, for me, and I, and I think I learned the most from those practical, tangible, like, very hands-on teaching. It was more of a, a better learning experience. I got more oohs and ahs in courses uh, as far as design went. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I, I can definitely like relate to that. I mean, I mean, this personally too, I don't think I was physically ready just to be like, all right, you know, like, I don't need college yet. Now, I wasn't ready to go full board. I did start a business while in college, but I didn't like ramp up till after college. Yeah. yeah. Like yeah. mentally, I just wasn't there from a mindset standpoint. I mean, yeah. right or wrong, I'm, I'll be honest with you, I wasn't, you know? <laughs> I feel you. Uh, and I think that leads me to this next point. Um, you having to be now, I mean, you started businesses and you help other people start their own business and even progress and, you know, achieve even better successes. Right. Um, so you have to be some sort of self starter, uh, Correct. a person that has to manage their time and, uh, how you came from a place of being in college and you weren't say you weren't ready. Right. I, I can agree. I can attest to that. I felt the same way. I didn't, I wasn't that ready. I don't know. Um, but how do, how do you make that transition where it's like, I wasn't ready then, but then when I got to this place, I can say that, you know, I, I wake up at this time. I do this. I achieve this. I make sure that this happens so that, you know, this part of the business can operate. Um, how, how do you, how do you manage your time and, um, how do you, you know, get to your point? <laughs> no, that's a great question. Um, I mean, sometimes it's long days. I mean, it's, I don't like to brag about, like, sometimes you, you, you got to work more than eight hours a day. It's not optimal to work more than eight hours a day, but sometimes you got to, especially where you I'm at. To. I'm still building my business, you know? Yeah. Um, I mean, it's going to get to a point where efficiency, where you don't necessarily need to do that every day. Mm-hmm. But I tell people, too, it's just sometimes, you know, like, you not may not be able to go out for Halloween weekend this year. You know, you, know, you got to make – it's not necessarily a sacrifice – it's I'm doing this to get here rather than, oh, man, I can't do this this weekend. Mm-hmm. So it's just a lot of it's, I think, self-reflection and what you value mm-hmm. and then allocating the time that way. OK, I, I, back to one of the first questions or actually first answer. Uh, you were talking about like building the right culture within a company. Uh, how does like a small business? How do they how do they do that? How do you develop the right culture? 
uh, within a company. Oh, man. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah, I tell people, and I, I give kudos. I mean, I'm primarily in the marketing business strategy space, but I, I tell people, and I actually have a cool episode coming up with an HR professional consultant. I'll definitely send it over to you. For, I, hey, all about love to that. listen to it. Yeah, um, but to me, I even – I'm biased, of course, in the marketing strategy space, but I tell people HR is the most pre- unpredictable factor in business. It is and always will be. I don't care what space you're in. Mm-hmm. Just because, you know, one day something can just happen with that person. It's just like they might be straight air, and all of a sudden it's like, oh, what are they doing with it? <laughs> so it's just, I mean, I mean, building a culture now, with my consulting group, essentially, it was initially I was just a kind of a freelancer. Mm. Um, I had my father just kind of as an advisory pieces for hospitality based projects, very part time, very just kind of like in the background, essentially, is me running the ship. Um, over time, I was able to develop a really great relationship with a really great advertiser and developer in the marketing space. I mean, we networked for about a year before we even hopped on a project together. Oh, and now wow. he's like my go to man. But it was just literally a year of just feeling each other out. And he even attests to it. Just like, who is this person? Who is, you know, that person? How can we actually gel? Because, all right, this potential person I'm bringing on on a line share of projects, you know, is practically going to be a partner in the business long term. Mm-hmm. You know, it's going to be a key asset. So it's just like making sure your vision for the business kind of gels with what they see, what they want personally and, and professionally in their lives and how they might, you know, come to the fold as the business grows Mm -hmm. yeah and one of the things i just thought about uh as you were telling me that about have built networking and stuff like that this past weekend (laughs) pardon me oh the beer uh this past (laughs) this past weekend um i was doing an event speaking with like small business owners and telling them like uh what are some like well, the importance of basic design and marketing mm-hmm. and why they should do it and, and you know the kind of the, the basics and the simple things right what do you see yourself telling the or what do you see yourself telling to business owners the most uh and as well as not only that but what do you also see yourself prescribing uh to these businesses the most i'll give you a great example i had a in-person consultation on this past thursday and okay. I'm open to the in-person, even with everything kind of going on right now. It's just comfort level. Comfort, okay. I'm a, I'm a big, I'm old school. Like, if you want to be in person, <laughs> we can. We can do social distance, the whole nine, depending on <laughs> what you're comfortable with. You know, okay. it's either or. <laughs> so I met th- with this particular gentleman in person. He's the vice president of a company here locally, which have an East Coast presence. I'm just like, tell him, uh, what's going on? Like, I, it was uh, like a really, like, organic referral. I talked to him. I said, how could you, you know, help me out? I'm like, well... Tell me what you're doing marketing wise. Oh, we know we've done radio, we've done TV. I'm like, all right, before we even get into digital, I mean, that's what we specialize in from a strategy standpoint. What are you measuring with radio? Is it unique call to action? You know, are you using like a unique domain, subdomain? Are you using a unique number of people call in? That way you can directly track radio leads rather than just general call leads. Are you doing the same thing with TV? And he's like, ah, not necessarily. I'm like, well, that's where we're going to provide value too. Even if you don't work with us, this is stuff you should be doing because mm-hmm. that way, yeah, I, I, I see it a lot, small and medium sized businesses, and even large companies are at fault at times just because of oversight. It's this if you're putting X amount of dollars to stuff and you want to be able to uniquely track it, digital, I mean, to me, in my experience is the easiest way to do it. Yep. Just being very familiar with it. But like radio, you can do it too. It's an antiquated marketing tactic you know for like younger people but it still it works in some markets in some niches but like if you're going to do radio make sure you have a unique call to action and or form of measurement that way you know those efforts are warranted all right and what he's speaking about is roi <laughs> return on investment the money that yeah. you spend on something how much you're getting back from that uh that kind of time or money spent um so yeah no that's that's very very important as far as like as radio ads are those expensive to to run Right now, they're cheaper just because of COVID cheaper. and everything, especially in my like, regional market. Um, I don't poo-poo them. Like, they can work, but like I just tell – these companies, they just sell bulk impressions. It's yeah. like, we get this many listeners. Great. Yeah. I tell all these small business owners, and I told this one, if, hey, if we're going to enter a, you know, a digital marketing advisory partnership where we'll be working with you on a 
essentially a retainer basis. Retainer is mm. a dirty word. We call it marketing advisory. Okay. What we do. <laughs> um, Rep- re- repaint the word. <laughs> yeah, Spr- no, I mean, really. Sprinkle a little bit of strategy. <laughs> yeah, that's what we do just because, I mean, I, I, I hate to say a lot of agencies have ruined the retainer model yeah. where it's yeah. like it's just dirty all yeah. of a sudden. Um, effective, though, for bottom lines, for an agency standpoint. True. But, um, <laughs> the accounts I, out I, there. I just told them in general, like, hey, you know, I'm not going to say, like, pull away your radio dollars. Mm-hmm. But, like, if we would work with you, it's just like, let's track it. And if it works, awesome. Let's keep it. And honestly, if it's really effective, scale it up. But if it's not, scale it back at minimum. So yeah. At that point, it's just like if you're spending a fixed budget per year, where can you shuffle and allocate that, you know, that budget where it can optimize in other areas prospectively? As a designer working with a marketer, right? And oftentimes you're working with like probably maybe the, the marketers are designing it as well. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, obviously have to deal with like individual contributors to help out. Uh, what do you see them creating the most? And as far as like uh, pushing out whether print or digital and, and creating for social, um, what do you see them creating the most for the, for these businesses? It's primarily digital assets. Mm-hmm. Um, my biggest thing too, it's just either if, if it's us working or getting content from a client or business, it's okay, content's great. We definitely want to test your content. Mm-hmm. Doesn't mean your content's bad. We want to test what's most effective. So if you have content, let's you know let's, let's do A/B tests and see what's the most effective for like these particular ad campaigns with these set audiences. So if we're gonna run this uh, one particular audience, let's run three different variants of content and see what hits the best that you have internally or what we may draw up for you. Mm-hmm. That way, you know, over time we can measure. All right, this design was effective with this base over this period of time. Let's do more of this rather than all right. I know we're spending a lot of time in this regard. Why why are we why are you doing that from a design standpoint? Right. I think I think that's very, very uh, it can be tricky, but I think it's super important. Very tricky. It is tr- it's a little bit tricky because it's sometimes like, well, well, do they really like the, the this creative over this creative? Um, yeah. yeah, go ahead. Yeah, it's really funny. And I, Sean, I tell people all the time, like I really look at things from an analytical lens, but I'm a firm believer where analytics and like really optimized, dialed in digital campaigns can only go so far Mm. because it's just based on what kind of content you have available to you. So great branding and great content can like make that like optimized digital campaign, take it to another level. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. That like, if you have like cap branding and or correlated content, you only can take it so far with, it doesn't, you can have the best digital market on the planet. If this is the content we only have available to us, I only can max it out to a certain degree. Right. I'm right. a firm believer in that. Even with like a more analytical kind of like lens on everything. Mm-hmm. With, with with your mindset and, and where kind of things are headed right now, um, we're going to just touch on this next point. I know we're, you're talking about antiquated like radio, like radio spend, mm-hmm. but people still do it and you can still make money from it and, and get a, that's very mass and, and, and wide range, very broad to, to collect uh, an audience. As far as like podcasting goes, and I know you have your own podcast, uh, so we're going to talk about that later too. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but as far as podcasting, do you see that as some a prescription or a, some sort of service that you provide to like, you know, get podcast placements for businesses? Do you, do you, do you kind of suggest those things or just dependent? Ooh, I have any, you're giving me ideas now. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> hey, listen, that'd be 10%. <laughs> hey, fine by me. I'll pick a check. We can run it together. Hey, beautiful. <laughs> But um, no, I really feel like it. To me personally, cod- podcasts have been like long term pillar content. Mm-hmm. I'm not necessarily made a direct like sale from podcasts to date. Mm-hmm. To me, it's just building a foundation of who I am and what the consulting group is mm-hmm. indirectly. Um, and with that, I can feel like other businesses can tap into that, and even more so specifically. Um, my podcast, I really just like to showcase other business leaders. And right. entrepreneurs and what they're right. doing. I think it's a lot of fun. Right. It essentially makes me a, v- a visible expert in that regard, just knowing like that space. Mm-hmm. Um, but for businesses from a strategy standpoint, if it's super niche, I think it'd like it'd be super effective. Oh man, I, I I have so many ideas of like how that could work. You know, you you see a bunch of these like storytelling and uh, scary and horror horror movie or horror podcast, you would say, not movies. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm at, I don't know, say Party City or one of these other 
stores you can get costumes i don't i don't know however you plan on like spinning that right and them getting some sort of ad placement 15 second 30 second ads uh and you know wherever you want to put them in i think could be super successful or, or you know can be used and uh done done very well i think the future of podcast is is kind of untapped uh, <laughs> and there's just so there's a bunch of random bunch of random ads out there yeah oh yeah and then like actually like podcasts like in sponsor like we're in recording sponsorships uh someone who does this really well is barstool sports in the very mm, yes yes um so i had the privilege of interviewing one of their personalities over the weekend excited for that one to drop um but she's like a, a zoomer dropped okay. out of college she blew up on tiktok like she's a legit like tiktok influencer oh man but, like her primary sponsor she starts every podcast right now for the time being she's like oh this one's sponsored by honey where i save money by couponing online but it makes sense it appeals to her base yep that's... where barstool was able to kind of secure those in like recording <laughs> podcasts where it seems super authentic it's not an ad it's brie talking about how she uses honey before mm -hmm. she like goes into her spiel of the week yeah no and there's some that are a little bit like oh your thing's kind of forced but i think the more genuine ones like that that you're talking about that kind of example are the ones that can be very successful uh um, yes so i really think that you know maybe an offer a spot with a little connection to businesses if it's really niche um and talking about the future of of kind of marketing and strategy and given that there's like new changes in technology and, and i think that's very big and it's coming from my side of things my big focus is on like technology and what's coming out right um ar and vr seems to be making a big push coming out um and i'm very very excited for that and what that could mean and, and as far as like in your space what do you think that means for you as a market and strategist um and yeah and, and just in general a high overview in a sense yeah absolutely um i'm a firm believer in regards to the times that we're in right now in the short term experiential marketing is going to rule the day I mean, right now i know we're social distancing and being very precautious but vr will have a huge component of that to still have experiential experiences with brands and interactions with those brands and their products and services um i believe uh, i've had this view for a while malls of america the mm -hmm. future of malls are they're not point of sales they're point of marketing mm -hmm. could you exp expound on that so it, the, the malls in america it's gonna be a point of marketing in terms of how you interact with these brands and these businesses and apple already does it very well where you go to the apple store and it's an experience you test out the different products you might not necessarily buy a product in the apple store well you test it out then you might buy it online after the fact or you might call the store up hey i tested out the product the other week can i order this do you have this new iphone or this new macbook you know Super i'm ready true. to buy it now Super true. or it's a point of marketing <laughs> rather than a necessary point of sale yeah Wow, I, I'm I'm ex I'm excited to see where that goes, and I mean with new like five G coming out and things being faster, and you know how you can you can network or connect with people in in, in a much broader sense and hyper in a hyper way. Um, mm -hmm. I think in the next ten twenty years, I think what is it by by annual? What's the what's the twenty year call? Is it and what is cent cent not cent whatever? Yeah, the next I, twenty I years. Kanye used the term in the Rogan podcast the other day. It was yeah, like, yeah, it's yeah. Something wild. It, Something it's not like, like a decade, but. Something the times two, <laughs> so I think a really big word exactly right. So in the next like twenty years, I think there's gonna be a big focus on connectivity, and yes. connecting people. Um, so I'm I'm curious to see where that what that means as far as advertising and marketing goes, um, and and just in creative space in general. Um, so let's see where, let's see where that takes us. Um, uh, another thing I've seen uh, that you talked about is like disrupting and kind of like disrupting industries and spaces like could you talk a bit more with that what does disrupt disruption look like for you absolutely i mean i primarily deal with like small medium-sized businesses mm -hmm. so with like taking strategies and more mature businesses in their spaces or in other markets so i'm in the mid-atlanta market so central pennsylvania like baltimore county like like dc metro area to give you mm -hmm. an idea for like any like listeners out there it's like what strategies are going on with businesses in those particular industries in new york city California, Los Angeles, um, maybe Texas, Dallas, maybe more typically more mature markets across industry verticals. How can we apply those strategies where these particular businesses who are clients of mine to have competitive advantage in these local marketplaces where necessarily these strategies may not be commonplace yet? Mm -hmm. That's what I primarily mean by disruption more than anything. Yeah. 
Yeah. Uh, and, and as far as like, I remember we were just talking about podcasting. Uh, you have a podcast out. Could you tell us yeah. a bit more about that? Yeah. So it's, it started at, as like a labor of love. This is something I wanted to do just for the hell of it last year. Shift out of our rocks. I love hanging out, having drinks and talking to people. I'm like, why not? You know, last year started just getting a lot of people, my first degree network friends and, you know, professional colleagues. And it kind of branched out to some really great connects this past year, you know, like a second season format. Um, it's a podcast where, you know, you have business leaders, entrepreneurs, creatives on, you see a different light of them. I ask them questions, tell me about you and what you're doing. I ask really specific industry knowledge, but then, you know, you go on tangents. I, I give a great example. I had a, um, an owner of a real estate brokerage here that's fairly well known in my local marketplace. Um, but we're talking about like real estate strategies in market, out of market, what's hot, what's not. And then we end up talking about why you shouldn't play R. Kelly at weddings anymore. At <laughs> but it was just like these organic <laughs> moments and tangents where you make these people more relatable, honestly, which yeah. at the end of the day, you know, a lot of it's we see LinkedIn culture and it's great. And younger people like you and I, Sean, it's just like it's getting more dressed down. But it's nice to see these professionals in a more personal light. I feel like you're able to connect with them more in that this kind of format. Mm. Yeah, talking about LinkedIn, do you like the new uh, story feature they added in? I haven't tested it out yet. I, I've seen a few, but like, I want to have to play around with it, honestly. Yeah, I want to try it. I, I I tempted it for a little bit, and I think maybe made a connection off of it. But honestly, I, I don't know. <laughs> I'm it's, I'm kind of like, uh, do I want to know about your personal just life? Kind of piggybacking off the whole Facebook Instagram kind of model, but we'll see. Right. Yeah, and and back to you, the um. What do you think is something that people don't necessarily know about you that you wish they did? Oh, that's a great question. <laughs> I'm pretty transparent, honestly. Ooh. I can help you out when it comes to strategy and analytics. But um, <laughs> no, I, um, I'm a big connector. So like, ask me if what's going on. Talk to me. If I can't necessarily pinpoint you and help you directly, I'm going to refer to you someone who I possibly can. Another fun note, really random. This is like getting off topic, but yeah. <laughs> my father wrote a book about his like life experiences about organized like crime and like it's like fictionalized in Baltimore in a past life before he owned a bar. <laughs> so really cool what we're doing in that regard. It's like we independently published it back in 2017, and I, I mean right now we're kind of shopping like a TV pilot. So that's really cool. So like definitely pick up that book before it's like a TV show like Ozark. That's the what, what is it called? It's called uh, Amusement Only. Amusement Only? Yeah, it's like okay. by Paul Schiffauer Sr. Okay. Send me Paul the link. Schiffauer. Send me the link. Yeah, we're gonna put it we're gonna put in we're gonna put in the show notes and on the YouTube and it's a really interesting like book. Like it's 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 made for TV, honestly. Uh, that, that's gotta... like my passion project outside like work. It's just getting his story to the masses. He's mm -hmm. like semi retired. He helps me from an advisory standpoint when it comes to the hospitality projects, but he just wants to write like T V scripts. TV scripts, right? <laughs> that, yeah. No, that's an amazing passion project, especially in retirement. That is really, really cool. What What else do you do on, on your free time when you're not working? Uh, and then you're, you're a different Paul, the, out, the outside of the business Paul. <laughs> oh, man. I mean, honestly, I tell people at this point, Sean, like, I feel like business Paul and personal Paul are almost like one person. Oh, it just blends in all together? I, I designed it almost intentionally that way. <laughs> like, podcasts are like me just like if I was socially out, but I know it's just on camera, we're just recording it. <laughs> yeah. I feel you. I feel you. It's just chit chatting and, and talking it's away. A, it's fun. It makes it easier that way. But um, no, I love cigars. I, I wrote a paper on um cigars in college about the quality assurance and like why like the cigar aficionado uh scaling of cigars is flawed. How it's not necessarily like an accurate measurement of the quality and taste of a cigar mm. because they do a quick test rather than a full smoke on how they have their point system. Ah. Uh... I'm a very big at like, like kind of like a naive aficionado at this point. Okay. I'm not as technical as, as I that was, <laughs> but I'm really big on that. I play a little fantasy football here and there. What team? Oh. oh, team. So I'm live in Pennsylvania. I'm a Baltimore native, so Baltimore Ravens. <sighs> I thought you were going to say Eagles. I thought you were going to say Eagles. Nah, but... Eagle, I'm cool with Eagles fans. Okay. All right, that's, what Eagles. That's, that's what matters. That's... <laughs> I don't so know how I became an Eagles fan. They're Eagles fans. I, I feel for them right now. It's a little tough out <laughs> yeah, there. Yeah, no, it, it's hard. 
it's hard every day it's like oh we're, uh, we're gonna win no i don't no. i don't know <laughs> lamar jack there right now he's just special it's awesome to see like their offense doing something yeah because i yeah. grew up they had no offense oh no just defense you know it's gonna be a good defensive game oh yeah like you, defense, Mass- yeah yeah their kicker's gonna kick like five field goals to win yeah yeah that we're gonna, gonna the game. be 17 points on the board but we're it's gonna be a good game <laughs> that's what i tell people like ravens fans back home like now like the Ravens put up this crazy offensive season last year. Now they're like, oh my God, Lamar Jackson, like, <laughs> we're not putting over 30 a game. I'm like, you're spoiled. Like, you had one good year, now you're spoiled. Like, the offense didn't do this for like yeah, 15 no. years. Exactly. Like, come on. Like, exactly. Enjoy what we have right now. Mm-hmm. It, talk, talking about sports, um, seeing what, what was has been done by the NBA, and they did an amazing job, like, with COVID and Black Best Lives Matter. playoff series I think I've ever seen. Amazing. It was, Amazing. it was beautiful. It was super competitive. I don't Great. know your thoughts on it. Like, I tell people, like, my two primary sports I like to t- tap into, NFL, then, like, NBA playoffs and right before the playoffs kick off. Because it's just another breed of competitiveness. Like, but this playoffs was special. I feel like it was an even playing field. And you had some crazy, like, lower seeds were super competitive. Like, the Miami Heat. Like, yeah. Weren't favorites to make the finals. They made the still, finals. I did call ever, that, though. You did. You did? <laughs> I called it on a podcast I recorded back in August. Came out in September. I'm like, Heat Lakers. I told my uh, buddy Harper, <laughs> I'm like, Heat Lakers. Is like, yeah? I'm like, yeah. Called it. You put money. You should have put money on it. <laughs> I should have. I had Lakers winning, but um, oh, yeah, same, team's gonna be same, good. Same. I'm big Lakers fan. So so back to to this to NBA. Like they did an amazing job with like the whole Black Lives Matter and stuff like that. Um, I see a lot of excitement around the NBA players. Again, I love that whole playing in the bubble. Don't get me wrong, it's a little tough not, you know, it's not seeing your family and stuff like that and given situation, right? It was an amazing playoff, so they handled it well. So shout out to Adam Silver. Now he should run for president. <laughs> I love what he did. I love <laughs> I love what he did. <laughs> he should he did a good job. Uh NFL has a lot of like shutting down of their players and like bringing their voice down. Um, given that you might only know like the select few, like the quarterbacks, the skill players, right? Mm-hmm. Um, I'm gonna tie this back into marketing. Just give me two seconds. So- <laughs> yeah, I feel you. Like you know, looking forward to it. <laughs> so, seeing how like the NFL brings the players on, I've also seen MLB play, and they've been trying their best to make it a bit more, a bit more exciting as a sport, right? You as a marketer and as a strategist. Okay. How would you make the MLB a much more exciting sport and bring NFL's voice up? Oh, my goodness. This might be a very unpopular opinion. Okay. So, I wasn't – I was. you and I were probably young when this occurred, but, like, I feel like the most exciting point of the MLB in probably the past 30 years was the steroid era. The steroid <laughs> I'm serious. I, I, I believe it. Just home my runs old, all day. I'm not saying like do steroids, but like <laughs> my old man used to tell me like when he had the bar, like people would come in literally to see like the like the home run race between McGuire and Bonds. That wow. was the thing. Like, it was like prime time television, like regular season. Who who's going to take the lead now, McGuire or Bonds or Bonds this weekend? I feel like, and I honestly, I'll put some flack on the Yankees club. You want, like, team unity. I know they got the team brand, but, like... Uh, I'm not a fan. The MLB, they don't have a lot of superstars. No. And I I feel like it's just because maybe it's, like, a traditional traditionalist culture. They they need some, like, wild cats. Like, more like Bryce Harper when he's in D.C. Just, like, a little lamp. (laughs) Like, within reason, but, like, Mm -hmm. that would add a little more excitement to the sport. Yeah. Give us an Ocho Cinco in baseball and and see what happens. (laughs) Absolutely. Hall of Fame jacket. (laughs) <laughs> spice it up a little bit and and as far as the nfl goes right like i, I grew up playing football in my life uh that's kind of i got to become an eagles fan and i don't know the first football team i played on with it was Bless the you. eagles uh yeah, i know i know <laughs> it's hard it's been a long time uh, kind of dub in the yeah Super Bowl. That, was, that was awesome yeah we needed it we definitely needed it it's because a lot of shit talking from a lot of nfc east fans and i, I just couldn't deal with it <laughs> A lot of uh, lucky Giants fans. I, I so you guys, might, I, I feel like you guys are still going to win that division this year. I think we are, but it, it's the way we're going to win. It's like eh, we stumbled and fumbled yeah, and bumbled. Like, but here's the thing: anything could happen if you guys get healthy. That's true. If some That's of these true. receivers that are down right now come back on offense, I mean, really, your offense is decimated. That's really it. Yeah, yeah. 
if people get better and healthier, then I think we maybe have a shot in the playoffs. Maybe, if that. So we'll see. Uh, and and see. So the NFL. So like seeing is like they only have, they have some superstars, and it's much more superstars than I would say MLB. But because of like wearing helmets, you can't see the players' faces, or you see the quarterback everywhere. You know. Um, yeah. There's been a lot of like talk of like NFL players' voices being like drowned out or put down, and I, there's somewhat have been a kind of change happening this past year. Um, what is something that you would, if you had the position or you, you were in that place of bringing uh, tasked with that kind of task of, of bringing a voice or setting up a voice for NFL players, uh, what would you do? Well, that's a phenomenal question. You're making me think for a second because <laughs> I'm all about the entertainment, honestly. Like, yeah, yeah. You hear traditionally like players like Chad Ochocinco, Ch- formerly known as Chad Johnson. Yeah. A lot of flack. A lot like, of flack. I love, Tra- I love Terrell Owens. Yeah. Terrell Owens is one of my favorite players yeah. <laughs> I've ever seen while I play the game. Get your popcorn ready. I love Made it. TV. I love it. Just... Like even when he was the Eagles, when he's <laughs> out in his driveway doing sit ups, phenomenal. Yeah. At this, I really feel like it's, it's interesting because it's the, it's a PR thing. Mm-hmm. in correlation the media gives these players a bad rap these old heads or older fellas i should say who are in the media oh you know like this player shouldn't be doing this and then the club's like oh you maybe you shouldn't be saying that or doing this it's just give a little more liberty you mm-hmm. got to create a culture internally where you can be more expressive yourself but as long as you're at the team by, about the team at the end of the day it's okay right like you can have chad johnson but as long as chad johnson plays and like it's not really derailing the team. It's okay. Like same like Terrell, you know. I I agree. I I think you what you see in the entertainment, what well, the entertainment of sports, um, you're kind of seeing in the workplace, mm-hmm. where people are given a bit more liberty to be themselves, to to be true to who they are. And I think once you do that for people, you kind of get, I want to say, better productivity. But you get someone's like full authentic self. I think you get 110% from people when they're allowed to just be them and be who they are. And and the the space that they're where they're at is provides the opportunity. So I, I definitely, I can see how those kind of like bridge together um, in a sense. It's a more um, of a cultural aspect, I feel like, yeah. internally between these like GMs, coaches, and ownership. Yeah, yeah. And I, playing a good playing a good one is, is really important. And you see that there's some coaches that kind of got fired this past. <laughs> These last couple of weeks, just beginning to let go, and well, I've been losing, but you can kind of see. I mean, this week is the prime example. Of Antonio Brown signing with the Bucks. How's that yeah. going to play out? Right. Huge uh, personality. He has the stigma of being a hothead. I still think he's one of the most talented wide receivers the league's ever seen. We'll see how he integrates with the Bucks offense, but I mean, hey, just watch him play. When you got uh, when you got Brady back there, anything is possible. <laughs> Exactly. I mean, he's been playing phenomenal the past couple of weeks. Exactly. Um, yeah, so I, I don't mean to like, take up all the time. So every episode with Strategy Snacks, we try to end it off with a Strategy Snack. And for those that do not know, um, a Strategy Snack is a gem, a piece of information um, that business owners, entrepreneurs, or creatives can take away. Um, we give that opportunity for you. And we would like okay. to know what your strategy snack is that you would like to tell people. All right. Well, that being said, my strategy snack for tonight, I would say, I mean, kind of piggybacks on what we've been talking about this this past episode is look at your core values, be authentic to you, and then how it correlates to your intended audiences. Not as just your customers or mm-hmm. clients, but people who view you might refer you and champion you out in the marketplace and the community. So, I mean, with that, take that one step further. It's this, who are you Who are you online? Who are you physically? Who are you over the phone? Who are you from start to finish in the process from a brand standpoint? I think that's the most important thing someone can take away. Okay. And make sure that correlates and kind of lines up. It's just like, it's one thing you have like a website and then you meet them in person. Like, damn, like, who, who the hell is this asshole? Like, no one likes that, you know? <laughs> They they had a testimonial where they're a nice guy, and then this like they have a terrible customer service in person. That's not on brand. It's not yeah. Authentic. Yeah, I agree. That needs everything needs to line up. 
in fashion and you there can't there, if if there's ever kind of like a disconnect there's like well something here's a lie and and something here's a front yeah it's it's being vertical from top to bottom it's never gonna be foolproof mm -hmm. it's always room for improvement i mean my app operations background i always think there's always gonna be something suboptimal in what you do but then you looked at how you improve those areas but um i'm a firm believer it's just who you are online who you are physically it's got to match up it's even like business owners too it's just like you might have this great service and you have a terrible website that doesn't reflect that you need to fix that up and you need to call ship our consulting group and then have sean do your branding yeah as a preferred partner <laughs> <laughs> i appreciate it we need that we need that connection <laughs> so they, i appreciate that man thank you um i want to thank you for taking out your time and, and leaving your mark here at strategy snacks and and appreciate all the time and, and and the good words that you put in appreciate that no i i appreciate the opportunity i mean this is the first guess i have spot i have had in over a year it's kind of in my own kind of echo chamber doing a lot of client work doing my own pillar content mm -hmm. so when you reach out you're like yeah you want to hop on i'm like yeah that sounds great like i love the opportunity like i don't let's do it like, let's tell me more about it I, I checked out a couple shows or the one in particular like in full detail i'm like this sounds awesome let's do it I appreciate that. Thank you so much, man. Uh, I mean, you also have, again, you have a, you have a pod, uh, podcast. Could you, can you let people know like where they can connect with you? Speak more about what you have going on. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it's called Ship Out of Rocks. It's available on um, all major streaming platforms, Spotify, um, Apple Podcasts, you name it. Um, also available on our consulting agency, consulting group, YouTube channel, SCG TV. That is short for Ship Out Consulting Group, SCG TV, where you can find the episodes there. I'm about to break it, everything up in the clips, though, just because everything's kind of long form right now. Yeah, yeah. Some people want the whole smorgasbord. Some people just want a little appetizer, you know? Yeah. They want a snack. Little, a little bite, a little snack, right? <laughs> <laughs> but so, um, no, Sean, I had a, a great time. It was nice meeting you and kind of talking to you one-on-one -on -one here. It's a pleasure. Fashion. We'll definitely have to do it again. For sure. And, and maybe another time in person, grab a beer, grab a drink. Uh, we can hop over to your podcast. I'll definitely, definitely appreciate that. Oh yeah. That'd be great. Thank you so much, man. All right. Hey. All right, guys. So thank you for checking out another episode of strategy snacks. This is Sean Marcano. I am your host, your designer, creative, the executive of this whole, this whole platform we got going on here. So, um, I'm really excited for this and, and I finally found a routine that works for me and, and I hope you guys are enjoying this and enjoying this content. Um, if you are business owners out there, if you are entrepreneurs, um, if you are a creative or some sort of designer, UX, UI, graphic designer, so on and so forth, uh, feel free to reach out. If you want to be pre presented on the, the platform, you want to come on here and, and talk uh, and leave your mark with a strategy snack, feel free to reach out. Uh, check out the show notes below and, and ways to get in contact with me. Or if you want to get connected um, with Paul, feel free to check out the show notes below as well um, and reach out to him. And he knows a lot about what he's talking about in regards to strategy and how to develop a business. And he has many, many years of experience doing that. So do get in contact with him. Um, and I, again, I appreciate you guys for checking out another episode of Strategy Snacks. Again, I'm really liking this microphone right here because I think it's very easy to talk into it versus reaching over to the side. Um, and it's a little less of me like rocking back and forth to like be able to speak. So um, I might I might just keep it here. Uh, but yeah, thank you guys for checking out another episode of Strategy Snacks. And I look forward to uh, hearing from you guys. And uh, yeah, that's another episode. Take care.